Hello everyone. So this week I decided, for the sake of all of you spiritual junkies out there, I'm going to throw you off the deep end a little bit into some serious information. <laughs> we live in a universe of polarity. Polarity is necessary for the sake of expansion. We know white by knowing black. We know freedom by knowing imprisonment. We know our goodness in contrast by understanding what we've been calling evil. Part of that polarity that we see as evil is what we've been calling demons for centuries. A demon is essentially a thought that was created through the vibration of lack. Instead of being the vibration of source consciousness, it is the absence of that vibration. It is a thought that has been focused on long enough that it has become a thought form. A thought form that is capable of creating its own ideas, its own desires, its own prerogatives. A while ago I did an episode on YouTube titled, Do Demons Exist? In that episode I explained what a demon is. I suggest you watch that video if you want to understand what a demon is in depth. Demons are a thought that belong to the opposite vibration to that of love and freedom. We could say they are the ultimate manifestation of separation. As such, they do not experience themselves as being connected to source consciousness, regardless of the fact that they are. For this reason, in order to maintain their identity and not dissipate, they must take energy from somewhere else. But they are only a match to those who vibrate at the same frequency as they do. People who feel totally powerless, totally ostracized, and cast out. People who are stuck in a feeling of lack. People who are trying to compensate for some craving within them. The primary way that demons feed off of human energy is through unmet needs. In a previous video, I explained that it is not possible to unneed something that you need. And so what happens if you have a need but you can't figure out a way to meet it and somebody makes that need wrong is that you try to get it subconsciously in ways that are backdoor instead of straightforward. This is what we call manipulation. Manipulation carries a big stigma with it. It makes it sound as if someone's malevolently controlling someone else, but in reality, it's a highly subconscious and also quite innocent process. Manipulation is what we do when we feel we cannot meet our needs directly, so instead we try to meet them in roundabout ways. We try to influence others to do what we want them to do so our needs are met. This is particularly prevalent today when that need is not met that is emotional. When the child cannot get its emotional needs met directly, those emotional needs get hidden or exiled from the whole being and delegated to the subconscious. And they begin to become manipulative to get those now subconscious needs met. So let's think of an example. Let's say that there's somebody who has a subconscious need to be protected and to be kept safe. That person might subconsciously create scenarios in which they have to be rescued. And that manipulative way of going about it enables them to be rescued and protected by a savior, someone who sees them as in distress when that may not really be a genuine reflection of where they are. Now, how do these two concepts go together? Because demons perceive themselves not to be a part of God, not to be a part of the greater universe, of source, they feel so separate. They cannot receive their need for universal source energy directly. So what do they have to do? Manipulate. They have to get their needs met through that which they see as other. Because they are essentially the embodiment of this vibration of manipulation, they are a perfect match to other people who are also in that vibration of manipulation people who aren't getting their needs met directly. A little secret is that demons are just very extreme mirrors of the inner child who could not meet its needs in direct ways. We exile demons in our society in the same way that our original unmet needs were exiled into the shadow of our own subconscious mind. But here's a little problem. If demons are a perfect vibrational match to people who are also in a vibration of manipulation because they're not getting their needs met, because they're in such an extreme vibration of lack. They aren't breaking any laws by attaching to them. In fact, they are acting in perfect accordance and obedience with universal law. 
For example, let's say that a woman has poor self-esteem. Her self-concept has limited energy. She does not know how to generate that energy from within and the people around her are reinforcing her poor self-esteem. Perhaps she'll notice that the women who get what she needs and doesn't have are those who are wanted by men, so she develops the desperate desire to be wanted by them. In order to create this, she may become very good at the art of seduction. She will learn to get her self-esteem fed by seducing men and soaking in their energy of their attention and adoration. This is an innocent manipulation. However, manipulation makes you a perfect match to a demon vibrationally. As a result, there is a likelihood that it a demon will attach to her and feed off of this energy. But where is the transaction that is taking place energetically? What does it mean to sell your soul? Demons are embodiments of different types of pain. In fact, I want to take you back, those of you who are familiar with Christianity, to the seven deadly sins, but I want you to look at them in a different way. I want you to look at the seven deadly sins as if each one of them is a representation of an overcompensation for an extreme lack of something that is needed. Each one of them is essentially a response to pain that simply puts us deeper into pain. For example, when we feel the pain of not having enough, we can become greedy. So let's say that a demon is the embodiment of greed that is ultimately the result of feeling like one doesn't have enough. It will develop the incredible power to manipulate to get that need met. So going back to the previous example of the woman who gets her self-esteem met through seduction, she will be a match to a demon whose power is seduction. When it wants to attach to her, a subconscious agreement takes place. This demon will lend its power to the woman so as to enhance her power to seduce, so that both the demon and the woman can be sure to get their need met. She is essentially participating in an energetic transaction that is parasitic but symbiotic, whereby in exchange for the added power provided by the demon, she will get her needs met, so the demon can get its needs met through her. So let's go even deeper. What does it mean when people say they've sold their soul to the devil? Okay, so what we know about the Bible is that the Bible says that Lucifer and Jesus were essentially brothers. They had a different idea about the way that this universe should be run. Now, drop this concept of the biblical understanding because I know that many of you have resistance to that and let's look at this in terms of the universe at large. What if the universe at large, the mind of source, or God, separated itself into two different concepts. One of those concepts was determinism, the concept of no free will, that God's mind is going to be the only mind that ever exists, and the only thing that will ever exist is cause and effect, versus an idea within source consciousness of free will. That is, once there is a creation, one of God's creations has its own free will, and the free will to choose. Now, what we've been calling the devil or Lucifer is the one one who chose in favor of determinism, the absence of free will. When you manipulate to get your needs met because you are so desperate, there comes a point where you lose touch with your own free will. Essentially, this is no different than an addiction. When you're in the grip of an addiction, you feel out of control of yourself trying to get a need met. It feels like you lack the capacity to control yourself. So once you get to the point where you feel such a lack that you are so desperate to get a need met that you feel incapable of controlling yourself, when faced with the offer of that need being met, you have become disconnected from your own free will, and so you have vibrationally and unintentionally sided with determinism, and thus the being who gave rise to that thought, which we call the devil. Selling your soul to the devil is nothing more than engaging in a transaction that erases free will. I'll give you some more examples about how this type of dynamic works between demons and humans and this transaction that is made here. So let's say that somebody feels totally powerless. What they lack is that feeling of being empowered, feeling free, feeling sovereign. They want it, but they can't get it straightforward. So. Let's say that the only access that they have to that feeling of empowerment is the concept of overpowering someone else. So they start to manipulate to feel empowerment in this way. They may be a match to a demon who has the capacity to imbue that person with power. 
So when that demon attaches, imbues that person with power so as to be able to dominate other people, that demon is getting the kickback, the transaction, fed by sucking in the energy of those people on the other side when they're in a state of fear. Or let's say that a person desperately needs connection but can't get it directly, so they have to get it indirectly. Perhaps they will start to fake sick in order to get attention or become hypochondriacal. Now, let's say that they're a match because of this manipulation to a demonic entity that attaches to them and begins to make them sick. By making them sick and putting them in that condition, when people are fawning over that person and giving them the connection they need, that demonic entity is feeding on that energy of connection. The most important thing to understand is that when it comes to demonic entities, there is a transaction that exists on a mental and emotional level which enables a need to be met that is mutually beneficial to both the host and the demon. And in many cults, the members will first create the lack and then deliberately do a ceremony to attach a demon which benefits the cult to the person when they are in a state of lack. They will attach this demon as the antidote to whatever starvation they have created. They understand that lack is created by trauma, and lack in and of itself is trauma. The greatest trauma is the lack that the trauma amplifies. At its fundamental level, trauma is the experience of lacking something we need and want. So trauma is inflicted on the person so as to put them in this primed state for demonic attachment. When trauma creates an extreme perception of lack, the human auric field is not being fed with enough energy to maintain its integrity, and holes or empty spaces appear in the auric field. Demonic entities can enter and attach through these empty spaces. It can do this because it is a match to the vibration of lack. The dissociation that so often occurs during these traumatic experiences is merely a further opening for demons to attach. When a person dissociates, they have often left their body empty to the degree that a full-blown possession state may occur. What these groups do is to create an alter personality. That's a process that's easily done through trauma. Then when they have that alter personality present, they put that alter in a state of lack, they attach the demonic entity to it. Now, most people, when they see these types of alter personalities show up that are attached to demons or demonic in nature, they deal with them the wrong way. What they do is to try to deprive that alter of whatever food source that demonic entity is getting in the hopes that that will cause the demon to pop off. But in fact, it feeds it. Or they try to force a separation between the alter and that demonic entity. And perhaps they will succeed for a time, but the likelihood of it coming right back is very, very high. Why? Because you've done nothing with the preconditions that exist for there to be a need for that transaction in the first place. What we need is to become aware of what that deep need is that exists within that altar and meet it directly, as directly and powerfully as we possibly can. Because what happens is that those empty spaces, that vacuum, is filled within that person and there can no longer be a place for that demonic entity to reside. What you're doing is increasing the person's frequency so that that entity no longer has anything to hook into. It pops off. For example, let's say that an altar shows up that's attached to a demon, but in this particular case the demon comes through the person so as to scare people away. What we have to feel into is why is that demon scaring people away? Why does that benefit the altar? How does a person benefit by people being scared away? Ah, maybe it's that by people getting scared away in this moment, they get to be safe. Safety is that deeply suppressed need. So let's make them safe. How do you make someone feel safe? First and foremost, through loving them. So you love them completely, unconditionally. You put your arms around them. You protect them in any way that you can. And what happens? The person switches out of the altar, and eventually that demonic entity will pop off when that need is met enough. Now this is not to say that demons will not fight for their survival. In fact, they tend to become extra combative and active and charged when their survival is threatened, which it is when their source of energy is threatening to be cut off. But the truth remains the same. Meet the need and the person is no longer a match to the demon. But from there, those of you who are extrasensory or super spiritually advanced may want to take this further. 
once you manage to fulfill some unmet need for someone so as to cause a demonic entity who is helping fulfill that need to pop off, you can focus your attention on that demon. Show it another way to directly meet its needs. Love that demon. Take it as yourself. What would you do with yourself if this was you? Most especially, show it or make it become aware of its connection to source consciousness so it no longer perceives itself to be separate from that which we call God. This is the ultimate form of integration. Clearing demons from someone's auric field is absolutely pointless unless we do it in conjunction, direct conjunction, with meeting the unmet needs. Because the transaction exists for a reason. For example, Let's say that a person is so incredibly ostracized that they don't belong anywhere. Their unmet need is belonging and feeling wanted. Now let's say that a demon is the embodiment of the concept of possession. That happens when someone is in so much of a lack because they keep losing things and losing things that the overcompensation to the unhealthy degree, to the unhealthy side, is to grasp and keep and contain and hold things. Actually, this is a beneficial transaction for the person because having the demon come in and completely possess and claim them actually feels like being wanted for the very first time and belonging. So unless you provide belonging to that person, they will have an attachment to that demon. And for good reason, because it's the only place that their need is being met. <laughs> For those of you that understand relationships, the relationship between a human and a demon is, at its essence, a codependent one. One where our dependency on each other is in fact causing dysfunction and deterioration in both parties. <laughs> However, it's no wonder then why we're such a match to demonic entities if we can't even manage our human relationships in a way where they don't become codependent instead of interdependent. And a codependent relationship by its very nature is powerlessly addictive. It's at this point that I must make you aware that it's not possible to meet something's needs without loving it first. And without loving it, which is to take it as yourself, recognize yourself in it, you're not gonna know what to do you're really, really good, have you noticed, at meeting needs in people when you understand those needs because you have recognized yourself in them. It is that kind of compassion which gives rise to the correct answers. So, what does that mean for ourselves and people and ourselves and demons? We have to love them. We have to do the very opposite thing that we have been taught. Love is the exact opposite vibration from that of demons. And what is the opposite frequency of love? Separation, which is the same as fear. So separation is synonymous with demons, which is synonymous with fear. It is to push something away from yourself. It creates isolation. Love, which is the ultimate form of connection, is the single biggest unmet need within the human race. Isolation is the single biggest void within the human race. Love is the antidote to everything. Isolation is the root of all forms of addiction. So it is by loving these demons that we will assimilate them and disable any harmful expressions they may display. Well, this is a particular problem in modern spirituality and these communities because these communities have embraced the concept of independence with such fervor. In the modern spiritual world, we make people wrong for needing. In the modern spiritual world, we make people wrong for not being an island unto themselves, for not meeting every need they have for themselves. How many times have you heard people say, everything you need is within you and you alone, or no one will love you until you love yourself? Or how many times have people given you the impression that there's something unspiritual about needing anything from anyone else? It is through ideologies like this that we in fact feed demons because we enhance a person's sense of their own loneliness. Now, here I'm going to give you a little twist and it's going to make you laugh. These ideologies that center around independence were so often ideologies invented by people whose needs were not met by other people. And so the only way they could cope with that is to make it okay. So how do we make it okay? We latch on to some kind of spiritual truth that exists out there that justifies why our needs aren't met by other people, why we can meet them ourselves and we don't have to be dependent on them. In fact, why it's right. 
to meet them only by ourselves. We make loneliness the best alternative. Are you understanding that it's an unmet need that gave rise to this? That's lack, which is a perfect doorway for demons to enter. So I find it a bit ironic that one of the biggest doors within the modern spiritual community, which allows demonic entities to enter in, was the result of an unmet need. <laughs> The reality is that what we need is the exact opposite of these ideologies. What we need right now is to develop connection. What we need right now is to develop unity. What we need is to experience interdependence. We have to make a practice of oneness in embodied form. In every way we can possibly do that. Oneness within ourselves, oneness with other people. That is what is going to make it so that there is no longer a emptiness or a void where demons can influence the human realm. When we make any need not okay to have, which we so often do, we feed demons because it forces a person to become more starved for it and desperate, but have to suppress and deny that need, which is the fertile ground for subconscious manipulation. For this reason, I want you to watch my YouTube video titled Meet Your Needs. This is what we do when we practice self-denial. This is what Christians often do when they practice abstinence. This is what Buddhists have done when they practice non-desire. Unintentionally, they feed the very thing they are trying to prevent. And it's not even their intention. This is one reason why demonic entities and deviance is so rampant in religious communities that pride themselves on being so strictly moral. Need suppression is why Utah, the home of the Mormon church, has the pornography rates that it has. And also, so many demonic entities associated with unhealthy sexuality. So what you have to understand is that when you focus on these unmet needs being met, it restores a person to a state of wholeness. In that state of wholeness, the demonic entities can't attach. It's a bit like watching a spider try to climb up glass. There's nowhere for it to hook in. There is no way to influence a person. All we need to do when it comes to demons is to become aware of what unmet need they are overcompensating for and meet it directly and meet it powerfully. For those of you that are interested, stay tuned for next week because next week I'm releasing a video that is all about how to meet an unmet need. Now for those of you who may have been raised in the Christian church when what they said is bring in Christ's love, what they meant by that was free will, the choice. But what choice? The choice to love. When I described earlier in the video that Lucifer is this name that we attach to that choice within source of determinism, the absence of free will, to the opposite side of that, this is the polarity, we have Christ. Christ is free will. It's choice. The choice to love specifically. So obviously if you come at a demonic entity with the light of Christ, which is the choice to love, you are moving out of the vibrational range of that demonic entity and it cannot remain present. It is not a vibrational match. So for this reason, you do not need to fear demons. You don't need to concern yourself with it. In fact, if I told you that the majority of people, I mean the vast majority of people, it is a rare exception who does not have demonic attachments. The majority of people have demonic influence and several, you would understand that our focus does not need to be on demonic entities and how to get rid of them. Our focus needs to be on how to restore ourselves to a state of wholeness. Have a good week.